when it comes to public speaking, how much of yourself should you bring to stage? That's just one of the topics I'll be talking about in today's episode of Talking Talks. Hello and welcome to Talking Talks, a behind the scenes look at how great presenters make great presentations. I'm your host, Bree Williams, and today I'm joined by Rachel Service. Rachel is CEO of the Happiness Concierge, a company that gives people tools to thrive at work and in life. A TEDx speaker who has worked with companies across the globe, Rachel believes continual growth is the path to success, however we define it. She speaks from the heart. She says she's never met a microphone she didn't like and has one of the best smiles going around. So let's get started. Rachel Service, welcome. Glad to have you on board. And I would love to start. My curiosity around you is how natural you are on stage. And what have you done behind the scenes to be such an aficionado when you're on stage? Tell us. Um, It's definitely true. I've never met a microphone I haven't liked. And I think I was born doing cartwheels and imagining my own stage, imagining the paparazzi everywhere, imagining people applauding me. I like to call it uh, uh, enthusiastic delusion, (laughs) illusions of grandeur. But uh, to be fair, I've always felt so comfortable on a stage. And indeed, my dream brief is really to walk on a stage with a microphone and no script. I'm very comfortable in the in the beauty of ad lib and i think what i really love is people when i see an audience something takes over instinctiveness takes over i know what to do what i have had to teach myself and continue to learn and unlearn or relearn is what i experience inside and how to translate that so an audience can absorb that so for example i would love to sing and dance and talk four, five, seven times the speed that I'm currently talking when I'm excited. But I've learned because I've filmed almost every presentation I've done, just as Beyonce did in the early days. And I've rewatched every session to go, oh, how did that land? Or I know what I'm saying, but I bet the audience doesn't know what I'm saying. Or why is it that my subtitles can't keep up with the pace of my speaking? So I've actually done a lot of work on watching myself, getting feedback and looking at myself and looking at the small things I can change, whether it's from changing this to this while saying the same thing. You know, it, it just makes a huge accumulative difference and feeling unafraid to say I'm in service of the message for the audience. And it doesn't matter how passionate you are about your message if the audience can understand it it simply won't land. Oh, I think that's brilliant. And did you have a moment of epiphany where you where you had a, an experience where your message wasn't dropping, it wasn't um, being conveyed to people? You thought you'd done an amazing job, but for some <laughs> reason it didn't resonate? I remember small and big moments of, oh, I had a totally different intention. One time I was having breakfast with my then coach And I think it was a hot day. I've been running around from appointment to appointment and I had mini bags and I put them down. And I went, oh, hello. And I instinctively started kind of adjusting my jacket. And she said, Rachel, where are you? Are you okay? And I thought to myself, oh, I'm, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say next. But the person I'm meeting with who knows me really well is giving the impression I'm completely distracted what is the cue there and i said oh what do you mean she said you keep playing with your hair fidgeting with your jacket and i said oh thank you might just have to think about that and i kind of had a jolt where i thought i'd never forget that and it made me realize that my passionate energy my frenetic energy that is adrenaline i need to find a way to package that in a way not necessarily hide it but contain it in a way that um i can show that i'm fully present and one of the tools is through the power of body language so those of you watching who experience adrenaline, I know that I do my voice shakes and my hands get shaky and I get sweaty palms. I've learned techniques to, you know, wear certain shirts that hide sweat or put my hands in my pocket when I'm tempted to get very <laughs> excitable. Um, and of course, the power of eye contact and just taking three moments to breathe 
and two months to breathe out before I connect with someone, before I go into the cafe, so they're not experiencing that rush. The, the adrenaline from one appointment does not need to be taken to the next appointment. There can be a container with which to address that with. And the other piece of feedback that I got a few years ago was when I did this presentation and I just had a feeling, I don't know if that landed. I don't know. And I re-watched the film and I thought, that's what I normally do, but I just, I don't get a good feeling. I can't put my finger on it. And so as a result, I scheduled a follow up with the client. What was your experience like? What was helpful um, out of curiosity? And they said, Rach, it just actually didn't land. Um, we're, probably, we're probably looking for a bit more of a relaxed sense from you. And I thought, oh, that's such helpful feedback. When I rewatched the film, I thought, oh, I thought I was being professional. But I think what they fell in love with when they booked me, I think, was more the relaxed nature. And I think that when we want to do a good, good job, we can sometimes forget just to breathe out a little bit and bring that side of ourselves. So, and as a result, after every session at my company, Happiness Concierge, we have a follow-up with the client to say, what was your experience like? Mm -hmm. What did you learn? And what did you wonder? And often it's great feedback and often it's, we're wondering how do we do this? And from that, it makes you a stronger presenter. So often we're afraid of feedback, whereas we see it as it's data simply facts and data to drive your performance forward. What you do with that feedback's up to you. <laughs> Rachel, you have just shared so many great ideas. I mean, even starting at the point of filming yourself and making sure that your craft is being captured so that you can then play it back and learn from it because, and myself included, sometimes I just get through the presentation and, you know, on to the next job, whereas you're really pausing to see how how the experience was for perhaps your audience. And I think there's so much power in that. And we will get back to your body language. But the, the key question for today's episode, I think, is really how much of yourself do you bring to stage? And you could change, you could swap out stage to a client meeting or whatever the circumstance is. So what are your thoughts on that? Because you've talked about containers and almost a boxing emotion in and making sure that you're sort of controlling it. So how do you do that <laughs> but also bring, you know, the true nature of Rachel to life? Uh, well, I love this question because in my 20s and to a degree early 30s, I'm nearing 40 now, I thought that the idea of professional was being quite clinical um, it was a one-way dialogue, you know, it was asking the client how they're going and not telling them that you're going, no way. <laughs> you know? And it took me a long time to learn that it's a two-way dialogue, that trust is built on a two-way um, understanding of each other. And I think that I struggled for a long time to go from a subservient relationship with those I was there to support, serve, lead even and learn how do I make this, I'm okay, you're okay, we're both okay in this dynamic. So translating that to whether it's a client phone call or a sales call or a meeting or a on the stage, I think it's understanding what is the intention of this connection, the intention of our connection breeze to share, oh, what are you learning, what am I learning, what have I found, what have you found, that's a good question, kind of ping pong off each other. In a client meeting, it might be more the intention is to understand, you know, what brings you here today? What might be stopping you from succeeding? What's worked well? And what prompted you to reach out to me? Why is this appealing? Help me understand. And then we can talk about our own experiences or not. And in a meeting, it's often to, I'll use an example with my team members. I often have a script to remind myself at the start to say, this connection is about you. So it's time for me to press mute and ask you, what do you need from me as a leader or not need? <laughs> and go from there and I think that's the uh, understanding the intent helps me give myself permission to not need to be everything do everything or act a certain way and I think I I always like to bring in a lot of how when I feel like the most me where am I and who am I with so when I feel like the most me I'm in jeans I'm downloading my day with my spouse and with my family who are mocking me and you know high-fiving me I'm thinking, how can I bring that energy in? And when I don't bring that energy in, it isn't, I wouldn't say it's actually conscious. I would say the subconscious drivers of, am I enough? Am I successful? Is this professional? Am I wearing the right lipstick? Are taking over. And so I like to take a step back and say, who is this connection for? And, you know, the, the third part I want to mention is by trial and error. 
you know, I've got so many connections where I know I've just deleted from my brain because I just like, oh, I'd never ask that again or oh, I'd never act like that again. And maybe, you know, so I think it's about saying how can I, when I bump into this person in 30 years' time and, I don't know, let's say we're in Melbourne and we're in Mornington Peninsula and I grab a cup of coffee and I bump into someone I had a connection with, I go, g'day, how are you? I can authentically say, how are your kids? How have things been? Gosh, it's been a while. You know, here's, you know, what I'm doing. If I'm in a T-shirt with no makeup and sneakers on, are they going to get the same person who turns up with this, you know, microphone and laser on? Is that the same person? Because if it is, that's trust, isn't it? You know, our, ourselves can be the same one thing. Have I taken a while to figure that out? Absolutely. <laughs> what I loved about your TEDx talk was all around this public identity and breaking up with that public identity. And I'll make sure that I also... Um, have that in the show notes as well because your TEDx talk you had this identity around the burnout girl you know the person talking about how burnout is a bad thing and and yet you never you weren't feeling that way at a point in time <laughs> and so it's and I've represented myself in one way at a particular time how do I distance myself from that so without yeah. having to go through the TED talk itself any ge- <laughs> any gems that you might want to share around the role of public identity and not getting boxed into that. Well, having experienced it and since that TED Talk, having spoken to hundreds of people who said, this is me, <laughs> uh, the idea that my, I've outgrown my public self, I think I've, I've learned a lot, obviously, and one of those things that I've learned is we get trapped into this idea that there can only be one version of ourselves, that who we are now cannot grow or cannot evolve. And I like to use the analogy of an artist or a recording musician. Every time they do a new record, they rebrand themselves, they try out a new outfit, they might try a new style, and the world doesn't get mad at that. So why are we putting all this pressure on to be the same person? And I think it's about a relationship to commitment and the idea of our non-negotiables and not always having a comfortable language around saying, I know I said I'd like this. Since then, I have grown, and that's a good thing. And as a result, I'm wanting different things. This is not a rejection of you. This is not a rejection of us. And this is not a rejection of the world. Give me a minute as I figure out how to navigate that. And I think because we don't yet have that language, it can come out really in a challenging way. There can be a lot of shame or embarrassment. And if you read my TED Talk, it was, <laughs> it was also like, I'm doing what I love. I'm having an identity crisis. I don't want to do burnout anymore. I haven't got the solution yet. Is that okay? (laughs) And grappling with that and, you know, the deadline, it was kind of the perfect storm. I'm proud of myself for doing that. And even I rewatched it before our connection today, Brie, to say, I wonder who I've become since doing that talk. And when I look at her, I think I still resonate with that message. I'm proud of that. I would probably give myself a lot more permission to say it's okay not to know. You don't know the answer, don't need to know the answer to share with someone you don't know who your new self is. Even the act of saying, I love you, I think I'm changing, I'm nervous about that, but I wanted to let you know, is such a freeing thing. It can really help you deflate the balloon of stress. <laughs> I, I felt that as you were talking. And I think, yeah, there's a lot of, um, what would I say, for, for instance, political leadership or our CEOs, people in Um, you being one of them, but people in these roles of authority and on-stage speakers, sometimes we as a public want to box them in so that we know what they stand for and we have parameters around them. And so often we don't give our leaders license to experience or express that growth and so we like to pigeonhole people so from a presenter's point of view I think what you've suggested is a beautiful thing which is you're seeing the work in progress you you're being quite open and vulnerable about this is stuff that I used to own but I'm not the same person anymore and you're taking people on the journey so are you finding that is is the key to resonance we all know when we smell something doesn't seem right right we know the feeling both when we're speaking and when we're experiencing someone when we're thinking I don't reckon that's the real deal. <laughs> and I think that, that that starts your gut going, I don't know if I trust what this person is saying. But I think that because we know that feeling, 
we, I, experience feelings of I don't ever want to come off as that way. Yet when I have that cognitive dissonance, pardon me, of thinking one thing and saying another thing, I'm enacting that, I'm feeling that, and as I'm saying that, I'm live, I'm in a meeting, I'm in a client meeting, I'm on the, I'm on the stage, it's too late to change my script. I understand. And I think it's a, it's a nuance of presenting in that we must prepare to serve the audience. It is a disservice to the audience to deliver something that they, to, to not meet the expectation of, I've signed up to hear the burnout story. I'm not really, you know, I might be experiencing burnout and now I'm going to hear about Rachel building a business. This is a different flavor <laughs> in the textbook. I've not signed up for this. So I, I know that pressure. What I will say is if you have outgrown your story, it's okay to say, look, I've evolved since then. Let me take you back to a time where this was front of mind for me. You might be able to relate. And think about how can you connect moments from that time, I'll use burnout as my example, to what I might be experiencing now. I'm working really hard at not burning out. Like It's a full-time job, relaxing and <laughs> rejuvenating. It's wonderful, I have to tell you. <laughs> there are commonalities between these worlds. The person who experienced burnout had moments of doubt. The person I am now and will continue to be will continue to have moments of doubt. The person who burned herself out, herself out was exhausted beyond repair. I've had moments like that. It just so happens I've found a few toolkits along the way. You are on the stage or on the screen <laughs> because you have had an experience that you've either figuring out or have figured out. So there is strength to say, I was here. I'm not there anymore. Here's what I have learned. Here's what brings me back. When I go back to that place, here are cues to bring me back. The audience will not reject you for have growing. In fact, that is the, that's, I would say that's inspirational. <laughs> I want inspirational. The audience might cause to pause if there's a sense of, girl, I know things have changed. <laughs> you don't call it out on the front foot. I, love so. I want to return to this concept of serving the audience because I think that's so key. What if the audience think they want one thing, but you think they need something else? Have you had experiences <laughs> of that? Because, you know, it might be people think that they're going to be served by the um, burning out story, but, you know, you know that there's so much more that you can share. So, yeah, I mean, I'm curious about that, and particularly when you're working through a client prism, so a client booking you, so they're not even the audience. They've got their own agenda before you then even get to the audience. So number one assumption is the mother of all stuff ups, as they say. So assume nothing. We can never assume, but what we can take is cues, right? So using the example of a client, a client might come to me and say, Rach, I'd love to support my team to uh, learn how to receive feedback, learn how to source feedback. How can we have more effective conversations? How can we avoid um, some of the examples I'm seeing? <laughs> Help me with that. And they might give me a download of the team and what they're observing. And so I'm going into, I'm being paid by the client. I'm going in there to serve their team. Now their team might have a totally different experience and they might think, oh gosh, we have to do this corporate training. Oh gosh, this person on LinkedIn with red lips is coming in. Oh gosh, <laughs> feedback again? You know, already there are three, three or four barriers to them even, you know, being remotely open to your message. And in fact, that's what I train my team around. No one wants to be there. So you're already against the wall before you get in the room. So and to balance your question of how do we serve the audience needs with there might be another A, agenda, or B, you might make an observation that this might, could be more effective. C, I'm paid for an outcome. D, I'm paid for an outcome. There's a lot of things at play. So the message that I always take in is meet people where they are. And you won't know where they are until you hear that from them. And a great disarming way to do that is through, um, uh, through humour. They say that we, we connect with someone by laughing or crying with them. Now, in the corporate space, I lean towards laughter. <laughs> you know, so a great disarming tool, and it's called being self-deprecating, is to say, hey, I'm here. My name's Rachel Service. It's my real last name. Who here loves corporate training? And it already needs a bit of an eye roll and a laugh. And so we can say, look, I've got an agenda here. Your boss has brought me in. Before we start, what's your experience? What's going on for you? And I put down my tools and I might sit down or I might not. 
And it'll take a while, but it doesn't take long because studies have shown that people would much rather speak, forego the privilege of eating, having sex or making money to disclose, to share how they are feeling. Wow. And so once we, isn't that amazing? Yeah. Um, and so once we look at the analogy of our audience as a balloon, who, whether they're introverted, extroverted, somewhere in the middle, whether they had a great experience and they want to have a chat with you or whether they want to keep that to themselves, and I think you, they're like a balloon. And once we deflate that balloon by giving them the option of choice, you can participate if you want. You don't have to. <laughs> you do you. You're in control of you. You're an adult. Once we have that experience, I have all these insights and I might write that on the board if it's a workplace setting. Um, if it's a big stage, I might, you know, just <laughs> try and remember all these and I come back to it and say, so here's the thing. We know that feedback is great for us. Yet I'm hearing from you, feedback's really challenging. And some of you shared really challenging scenarios. Some of you are dying for more feedback. How do we do this, team? How do we? Because I've got a framework that, like I'll give you a case study, we saved $30,000 in a recent workplace from someone getting their time back. Wouldn't that be nice? So it would. So we're hearing that feedback is a bit painful. We're hearing they want our time back. How do we do this, team? Would you be open to a tool seeing it's you? If you hate it. Don't blame you. Your boss has brought me in to do it. Shall we just give it a try? And as we do that, I'm leveling with the audience. I'm not being disingenuous by saying, yes, this tool, I think the tool's great. I actually love what I do and I would happily do corporate training for the rest of my life. You know, I like, I love it. But I'm saying, what's going to be useful for you folks? And they might say, we've actually got a framework that works. Well, hey, let's use that and let's retrofit the same outcome to that tool. Great. Or they might say, well, we did train a year ago. I can't remember, but they did say this thing that resonated. Okay, well, let's use that as a guiding principle. So as a presenter, there's very much a sense of you're presenting to the audience. And, of course, that's true. A TED Talk doesn't fly off the wall. Like, you remember that stuff with six weeks you're rehearsing that. But I think it can be really helpful for a presenter or a facilitator or anyone guiding a conversation, whether it's a you're having a tip with your loved one or you're having a passionate conversation or you're there to get an outcome. What do I need to leave with? Am I open to being open how I get there? And the most important thing, can this audience feel 5% better about themselves after an interaction with me? They absolutely can. If our guiding principles are around audience before ego and making sure that our, we're around positive, enabling people's strengths and pumping up their tires genuinely, how do I do that while achieving an outcome? Well, let's get the keys to the audience. We do need to agree on where we're going together, though, and we've got techniques to get there. So from a TED Talk perspective, there were ad-lib moments I put in there because I thought, not enough, not enough, not enough laughs, right? Like, it's serious stuff, but it's also like, <laughs> come on, <laughs> let's have a laugh. So there were moments I put in there, and I used the word millennial because the audience I saw was very young. I hadn't prepared for a younger audience. Or I used little ad-lib moments of Beyonce's songs, yes, I know all of their catalog, but I got a laugh, so I kept going. Do you know what I mean? So it's about getting people relaxed with you. Instinctively, they will want to hate you. They don't want to be there. They've seen it all. You know, the audience already knows and thinks they know more than you, and, and probably they do. If we accept people are judging us, we can get on to the work of disarming and finding out our commonalities. And from there, we can come up with a plan. The audience needs to feel like they have a choice, though. I think that's really important. Another layer of gold that you've just provided, Rachel, um, Starting with humour, because yes, in your TED talk, there are a lot of laughs before you then move, and and in your presentations after the laughter, you get more serious as you as you go because you've onboarded them by that stage, which I absolutely love. I think the, there's also something really important about giving them choice, but what you're doing is also allowing them the space and the reflection to identify what's wrong with the status quo. So. What is wrong with how we're doing things now? Not that we would necessarily use this language, but what are their concerns about that? Because only once you get them to identify that, hey, not everything's great right now, until you do that, there's not going to be an appetite to think about change, think about a new world. So I love the techniques and how you take them on that, that process and the whole 5% better. Talk to me about whether that is actually something that you train in your team and is something that is, is quite an explicit kind of objective or is that something that you just, yeah, you know, sits at the back of your mind? <laughs> yeah, it, it is explicit. 
Uh, and by that, we say, look, at the end of the day, not everyone's going to love your slides. Not everyone's going to like you and not everyone's going to like the story you tell. But if someone can leave with their self-esteem validated, they're seen, they're valued or they're heard, your job has been done. Now, the client's paying us to get to an outcome, so we do need to balance that. But we cannot have an outcome with disrepaired uh, self-esteem. And we, But I'm giving you permission to not leave with an outcome, but, but have people with their chest held high saying, I can make a positive step forward. And I say to my team, things happen live. Things happen in Microsoft Teams and Zoom and session. I will always, I trust you and we've trained for this. I will always support whatever you've said in front of an audience and in front of a client. I will never undermine you. If you've said to the client, we're going to do three more sessions, we're going to find a way. <laughs> if you say to the team members, we've got this, we've got that, we will deliver that. And we have a rule where we say, Fix it now, debrief later. So there's nothing that you can do on stage which, it, which will be said as wrong or there'll be a black mark against your name. There is only, hey, how might we do it differently? And before people get to a stage, we do so much rigorous training in our lenses. Let me introduce you to the five archetypes of people who don't want to be in the room with you. They hate you, they resent you, they resent you on their boss, and you're there with a smile, totally irritating. We start there. And then we go into the one person in the room who's saying, I, would, I love your company. I want to work for you one day. Because let me tell you, that's not where we start. That might be where we end. But um, yeah, it's all about being seen and heard. And those are coaching values, isn't it? You know, the idea of being seen and heard and given the space to come to your own conclusion because the wisdom is within you. Only you know what's right for your unique scenario. And I think as presenters, we can put a lot of pressure on ourselves to need to know the answer. There's no way we can know the answer. So. I mean, I'm talking to an expert in workplace culture, of course, but psychological safety was certainly what came to mind when you were talking about your staff. So making sure that they have the psychological safety and the trust to move in the direction that they think is appropriate. And the the audience have psychological safety because you're you're allowing some vulnerability, you're, the ego is in the back seat, as you've um, described, and you're, in some cases, downing the tools. You're, you're putting the tools down, physically sitting down and being on balance with them. So it, there's not a power um, dynamic that has them resentful of the exchange. I just I, So I love a lot of what you're saying. I'm just going to um, showcase a little bit of your body language. I've deliberately taken the sound out so that we can concentrate on some of your body language. And I'll just get you to describe perhaps your approach to stagecraft. I don't know if you went to um, to my <laughs> school or what you did. Well, um, certainly it's, it's not something I learned. It's something that's instinctive, so I will tell you that. But to be honest, if I could dance my performance while singing, I would. You know, that is my preferred mode of communication. <laughs> so, you know, I think I've learned when I want a joke to land or whether I have adrenaline that I need to get rid of, I will put it in a movement. So, or when I've forgotten a line. So in the second example, where in a white, white jacket, you'll see me jump from left to right. I couldn't actually remember the line. Um, when you're experiencing burnout, you feel stuck and whether you're in this lane and I couldn't actually remember the other lane, but I jumped to the right saying, I have faith, I remember what's on the other side of this line. And then the line landed because it kind of jolted my adrenaline into, Rachel, come on, like focus on bringing this home. And in the example of this, when I was saying I was writing a blog, so I searched into Google, <laughs> I remember thinking, I've told this story so many times and I need the audience to know that I'm here with them and I need to not get bored by my own words because I'm not bored by the audience. I'm interested in people, but I've heard these lines, so I'm always looking for ways to bring myself back into the presence of the story. And then with the example of lying on the floor in the red dress, that was one of my earlier talks about burnout. I'm so grateful that I did film those because it helped me go, oh, so that landed, I'll probably oh, I'll do that a bit differently. Or when you do that, the camera can't see you, lovely. Tyra Banks always says, find a light, find the camera. Um, so I remember doing that because it's very, when I have shared my story so many times that I know how easy it is to become quite black and white about something that can be quite concerning for people to hear about anxiety and burnout and all the things that come with running out of your adrenaline. 
And so I in, in, invoke physicality to lighten the humor a little bit to say, look, it is dramatic, but let's bring home the point. You know, like if I'm to lie down here in this stage, here's a physical manifestation of what it was like to lose my adrenaline. This doesn't make any sense. Yet here I am on my phone sending emails lying down in my bed at home. <laughs> so I think there are ways to bring it home for the audience while also helping you as a presenter come back to a story that you might have memorized a lot. And I think the congruence um, between your movement and your words is the secret there because sometimes presenters can feel overly orchestrated and then that's the, the time that things jar with the audience yes. and not necessarily in the right way. So I think the, the secret there is about congru congruence. Um, and I think also a lot of presenters, particularly in a virtual space, are, um, are, are believing that they need to be impassive and not move around a lot. Now, as an audience member, when you're watching that, the eye hasn't got anything interesting to look at. And so then if the eye is like, so I'm, I'm now fading out and I'm going to start checking my emails because... You're not doing anything to engage me. Exactly. And we learn so vibrantly, you know. Some of us, like me, I'm a speed reader. I will always prefer to have the transcript of a video. And I'll listen to it, but I'll look for keywords because I know what I'm looking for, right? Members of my team like to listen to a podcast to learn. Uh, other people like to see visual cues and other people like to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So if you are a presenter, you might have a slide deck. You might have the captions on or through Osha, there's a plugin, Microsoft Teams, there's a plugin. You might also have you and say, hey, you can pin me if you want to see my face. If you don't, totally get it. <laughs> and or if your preference is to turn your screen off, put away the washing, you know, have lunch while you listen to this talk as a podcast, marvellous, because you know how you take in information. I will always, as we say, we always want to give people three cues before they have to interact. I think we all know the feeling of we're in a meeting and someone says, Rachel, and all of a sudden, you know, you say, okay, in a few minutes, we're going to do a group activity. Don't freak out, everyone. In a few minutes, so I'm going to put the clock down. So here's what you can do. Get a glass of water, take your time, you know, and just give people cues so the adrenaline doesn't go into fight or flight mode and they go, right, ah, I'm not in trouble and I'm not asked to public speak. And letting them know they have a choice, whether you prefer to listen, whether you prefer to communicate with your chat on and your video on, or whether you're more of a keyboard warrior. There's no wrong way to participate in session. Gives people that psychological safety, the sense of choice, and uh, a way to do what is intrinsic to how they learn, how they communicate. Back to your example of the a presenter who might be said, bring more body language cues into place. I once saw a fantastic presentation by someone who sat, sat on a stool in front of a computer and said, I want to tell you about data analytics, and this is my favorite topic. So I wrote it all down because I didn't want to forget a thing. And because he spoke quietly and he was somewhat hunched over and he was so passionate in his authentic way, the whole audience was, was including myself, leaning in. I don't know anything about data. And I don't know why I was even interested, but he was interested. And his body language was, as you said so beautifully, incongruence with who he is, and that allowed his passion to shine. Um, and, you know, that was years ago, and I've never forgotten that. So whether you're someone who communicates like this or someone who communicates in a different way, there's no wrong way to do you. I think what we're learning together is permission to do that um, in a way the audience can hear you is, is where the wow is and what a beautiful way to uh, close out this beautiful conversation rachel we were talking uh, in the initial stages about how much of yourself do you bring to stage and i think that's a, a lovely sentiment to remind ourselves that it's really about in service to our audience that takes a lot of pressure off us have the ego <laughs> in the back seat be prepared to be vulnerable and um, look, I just want to thank you for your time, Rachel. If people want to find out more about Rachel, they can find her at rachelservice.com and her business, The Happiness Concierge. The trickiest thing is spelling concierge, but is happinessconcierge.com. You can always find me at briewilliams.com and remember to subscribe so you get other episodes of Talking Talks and I look forward to sharing more with you really soon. Rachel, thank you so much. Absolute pleasure.